Good afternoon, everybody. I am just going to wait just another few seconds because we've still got attendees joining uh, before I kick off and then we will start. Okay, so this is the um, final uh, uh, ARC talks of this school year. Um, but it is, uh, we are going out with, with a bang. Uh, we have a really interesting session lined up for you today on uh, the extended curriculum and sort of going beyond the core uh, and how we can do that um, effectively. Um, so, and we have, a, we have a, a, an excellent, uh, an incredibly experienced and knowledgeable panel joining us um, who I am going to uh, introduce in a, in a second. Um, but just before I do that, just a reminder that, um, these sessions, uh, you can't, see, you can only see us. You can't see each other, but we uh, can see your your comments in the chat. So please, please do uh, put your questions, your comments, your thoughts into the chat. These sessions work much better when we have a lot of questions from from the audience. Um, so please do ask your questions. You don't need to wait until uh, our guests have stopped speaking. You can um, put them in at any time, um, and I will. Uh, line them up uh, when we get to the uh, question section later on um, in the panel. Um, we are also, just to let everyone know, we're recording this session uh, and it will be available via the ARC Talk section of the website in the next few days. So you will be able to uh, look back if you feel like you missed a bit or wanted to catch a bit or um, share with colleagues who may not be able to join us live. So we are, as I say, very uh, lucky to be joined by uh, an extremely knowledgeable and experienced panel. Um, we have uh, Professor Jeff Thompson, MBE, who's a youth activist, an expert in sport development and politics, uh, with over 25 years experience in bidding and hosting and legacy of major games. Um, and he is involved in the Birmingham Commonwealth Games on the board of that uh, coming up very, very shortly. Uh, he's also the founder and executive chair of the Youth Charter uh, and writes regularly on the subject of sport for social and human development. Uh, most excitingly, he is the former five times world karate champion, holder of over 50 national and international titles, and has been inducted into the Martial Arts Hall of Fame, which as Hall of Fames go, is a pretty cool one to be inducted into. Um, so welcome to Jeff. We also have Nikhil Briggs, who's been a teacher for nine years. Uh, working in schools in South London. She then joined ARC Acton Academy in 2018, where she's the assistant principal and teaches sociology and leads on culture and curriculum. In 2021, she was recognised uh, in a list of the 100 most inspirational teachers in the UK by The Guardian and the Department for Education. And she was selected precisely because, relevant to, to us, our session today, her fresh co-curriculum approach that empowers young people to engage in public speaking, social action and teamwork. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Steve Berryman, who is a composer, teacher and researcher. Uh, he is a uh, director of arts, culture and community for the Odyssey Trust for Education uh, and a visiting research fellow at King's College London and the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. He's also uh, president elect of the Chartered College of Teaching. So I am sure you will agree that is a very prestigious bunch of people. Um, we've asked them all to just do five minutes uh, at the beginning of the session, just to tell us a little bit about their experience, their careers, and their some of their initial thoughts on the topic of extended curriculum. And then we're going to go into a, into a broader discussion uh, on the topic. I'm going to start with uh, Jeff Thompson. Thank you, Simon. And thank you to ARC Talks for allowing me the opportunity to contribute to this evening's um, webinar. I think every journey that we talk about an extended curriculum and enabling young people to thrive through school and beyond. For me, as the non-conventional, I suppose, pupil at school, because it always about, I think the passions that we develop later in life are reflected by our educational experiences. Um, I lost my father at a young age, where the color of my skin and my accent from Wolverhampton to the East End of London, saw my disaffection and disadvantage, developed quite a volcanic temper, but my escape, was sport and the arts. And at Brickell Secondary in the East End, it was a whole curriculum integrated from eight in the morning till seven at night. There was always an opportunity, even when excluded into the corridor, where I'd be arguably in the gym with my PE teacher, who for that at that time were considered third-class citizens, not quite part of the teaching elite, but they were the ones who applied the emotional intelligence that would find out how I was feeling, why I didn't have the confidence and then instilled a bit of positivity. As I said, sport and the arts were available to me 
And I believe it is a fundamental human right that sport and the arts are made available to every child and young person in their mental, physical, emotional health well-being, even more so uh, as a result of the last number of years. But back then, as I've said, I had a pretty volcanic temper, but I discovered karate because again, I had to learn to defend myself because I was blessed with the height that I have now then. But being subject to bullying and having an accent that I got rid of pretty quickly because I had to adapt to my environment, beginning karate at a leisure center changed my life, a curriculum for life, discipline, self-discipline, not my mother's tough love, but that collective community of diverse skills and talents saw me start to set my own goals and achievements. And I discovered not only my black belt as personal curriculum achievement, but then discovered competition. I learned a different culture, traveled the world, won some world titles in the eighties. And that gave me a currency whereby I would be able to be listened to and possibly start to influence my notion of sport for all. The rights of the eighties saw me going to sports administration and for the last 38 years, I've continued to fight for the streets that I've come from on the role that sport can play in the lives of young people. I think it was 30 years ago, though, with the shooting of a 14-year-old schoolboy in Mossside, Manchester, when that city was bidding for the then 2000 Olympic Games, I realised that sport for all and even the arts had become for the few. So decided to co-found the Youth Charter with my former world champion and now wife, into developing a, a charity that would simply respond to the cry from the streets at the time. And we believed that sport should be playing a part in the roles of young lives, channel aggression, give hope and opportunity. And 30 years on of what I thought was only a three year brief, it has become what I believe has been an embarrassing um, life's work because I'm still struggle at having to fight and make the case for sport and the arts playing a significant role in the emotional intelligence and above all learning and curriculum development. The youth charter from a tragedy 30 years on has become a global movement for sport for development for peace. But primarily when we look at schools, both in a formal and informal setting, we believe that there is a classroom playground and beyond school gate. Um, I think integrated curriculum experience that can see what we've developed in one of our signature education programs youth-wise, the ability to use sport and the arts as the appeal and attraction to learning, but having some fundamental learning outcomes. And in this instance, read, write, and count. We, we've researched greatly and found, that especially in boys in particular, that their ability to read and, cry, and write as they, for their disaffection, become excluded onto the streets, become part of the universities of crime. 95% of them cannot read or write, they can count whatever they stole. But I believe that the fundamental learning outcomes with teachers that I believe are now coaches can actually start to look at well-rounded global citizens with rights and responsibilities and use the curriculum in a more creative way. So there's a core curriculum, an extra curriculum, I think innovative way of classroom learning that in the playground seems some of the more physical skills that can be applied with that vast diverse array of sporting and artistic movement. Beyond the school gate, we believe the wider community can play an ongoing important role, and we've developed a term of a, the term of a social coach. They simply first and foremost inspire with a story and develop relationships of trust, confidence, and respect. That has all culminated in Birmingham 2022's Commonwealth Games. We've launched a call to action where we intend to recruit, select, and deploy 10,000 social coaches in each of the major 10 cities and inspire a re-engagement of children and young people of up to 2 million. Everyone says that that's fanciful and I spend a lot less time trying to make the case to successive governments, but just appeal to indomitable human spirit. The social coaches contribute two hours a week. If everybody in a community contributes, young people are engaged, equipped and empowered, and the social culture and economic case is sustainable and well-made. I'm going to stop there for me. So I like to stick to time. Thank you very much. Um, and always appreciate as a chair, people who stick to their time. Um, right, I'm going to hand over to Nikel to, to give us your five minutes. Um, thank you, Sam. And thank you, uh, Jeff. So I'm Nikel and I'm an assistant principal working at Art Act Academy. 
Academy. I'm really happy to be part of this panel um, this afternoon because I think it's a really important um, you know, issue in the extended curriculum is something that we absolutely advocate here at my school. And just reflecting on what Jeff was saying, you know, I couldn't help but think about my own school experience and thinking about some of the things that we weren't necessarily aware of in terms of how to thrive. There was a lot of emphasis on, you know, those academic outcomes and GCSEs. And I think quite often what is overlooked is the importance of those soft skills and things like being really good at public speaking, working with others, all these other experiences that help make the whole person. And so part of that is the reason why um, the co-curriculum, as we call it at Acton, is just as important as the academic one. So for us, when we talk about it in our school, we always give that core message to our students because it's rooted in our school mission. Our school mission is that we want our students to be able to thrive, whether that is at university or a real alternative. We want them to be able to have a future of their choosing. Um, but what we are not, um, you know, one of the things that we are very aware of is the competition and the disadvantage that some of our young people unfortunately will face. And so for us, we know that we have a duty to ensure that we do everything that we can to ensure our young people are set up well to succeed. So in terms of what that looks like here at our school, our students, as always, will follow that academic curriculum, their formal timetable of lessons. But what we've also managed to build in is a period seven um, day, which is going to ensure that every single one of our students have access to our co-curriculum. Um, and part of the reason for that was because what we noticed before we built into our school day is we had a lot of different clubs on offer that were optional. And what was interesting is the students that tend to sign up to these clubs were not always the students that would necessarily benefit from it the most. We also found that some students just simply were not participating because they didn't know what, what the benefits were. And so one of the tasks that I had was how can I ensure that we put in place something that is going to allow the young people to realise just how important this work is, but also what it will do for them beyond school. And quite often when we talk about our school mission in assemblies, when we remind them of our school values, we always make those connections to the young people. And, and I always am a strong believer of, you know, everyone their age group, once they're 16, will leave with a set of qualifications at varying levels. But what will set them apart and what will help them have that extra edge is all the other experiences that they can also talk about. And so for me, it was really important to think about how we can put in place these opportunities within our school day to ensure that they can talk about the importance of things like public speaking and, you know, social action. So um, I think it's really important that we also get to know our school communities. So quite often what we do is we give out surveys to students we get a flavour of the kind of things they'd be interested in. And then sometimes we have to appreciate that they're not always going to know. So for this academic year, we've been quite directed in terms of the uh, extended opportunities um, that they have available to them. And one of the things I used was the Duke of Edinburgh Award. And they really do isolate key skills that are transferable in any walk of life. So, you know, we make sure that they've got opportunities to develop skills in public speaking and developing oracy. Um, we've placed a lot of emphasis on physical um, skills as well. So we've got a really comprehensive sports provision at our school. Um, and also tapping into those external organisations that are always keen to work with schools. Um, you know, organisations that I'm sure some of you are already familiar with, like, you know, Jack Petchy Speak Out Challenge, the first give project we've been able to work with organizations like the white city theater project because we know that young people sometimes they don't really know what they want to do and it's through these experiences that we may ignite passion it's through these experiences that they will learn um, to be able to work with others and to think about what they want to do going forward in the future um another thing i also wanted to 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 talk about in terms of how do we get that message across to students that it is just as important. Um, I've put in place what we've called the ACP and it's the Acting Character Passport. So all our young people know we're committed to developing their character. Um, and so they have got a range of different ways in which they can sign up to different opportunities in the school. So it might be to become a student prefect. It might be um, to find more out about careers, to join in terms of the music provision that we've got. 
Um, and I'm also aware that we are part of the map, so we get to liaise with colleagues in other schools and benefit from other programs that are available. Like we have a really extensive music offer um, as part of ARC and our students also get to benefit from that. But going back to that passport, we get our students to set themselves targets, personal targets. So it's not to do with their academic performance, it's to do with what are they going to set themselves a target for to improve themselves. So it might be they might want to um, set them start themselves a target for public speaking. And so they might join Debate Mate as um, a club. It might be that they want to improve their sport activity. So they might join football or lacrosse. Um, and a large part of our offer is our staff who, who put in place these opportunities by running um, these sessions. So I'm more than happy to talk about that um, a bit later on in the chat. But I just kind of wanted to end on the reality is that, you know, we're in a fast paced society and it's so important that our young people get to leave us with these experiences. And we know that in the application forms, there's that section on your personal interests and hobbies. And some young people might not really know what to put there. Um, you know, it's all these things that we help make sure that the students are aware of, in addition to the, their academic performance. So that's what I wanted to start with. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much. Oh, just one question before we move on: the the um, the, the passport. How how what's the process for them deciding what that what they want to add to it and what they want to what they got is it is it sort of a discussion with the, with the teacher is it is it more generated by them or more from you or or sort of collectively so what all our students will get is all of the clubs that are on offer and then they get to pick based on whether they want to improve public speaking or if they want to improve um in performing arts they get to see all that is on offer in the school and then they'll set themselves a target a smart target on how they're going to improve that so for example they may say okay i'm going to attend um the, the choir every thursday um period six for six weeks so they get to decide that with tutors we've built that into our um academic review our pastoral review day and parents can also feed into to that passport as well so that they're aware what their young person has um, signed up to. That's a great idea. Um, I really like that. I'm just thinking about trying to get my own kids to go to do after school stuff and it would be useful if they, if they felt there was some target and purpose to it. Um, right, I'm gonna to come to um, Steve Berman now just to give us the final intro talk. Hi, good afternoon. Lovely to, great to be third, actually, because I get to hear everyone else's story first. But I agree very much with Jeff, really, and Nikhail, hugely, that so much of your school, when you, when you look back at school, I think it's the things that happen on the peripheries of your school day that stand out the most. And music, for me, plays such a huge part. And interestingly, I used to choose instruments based on the subjects I didn't want to go to. So I would choose the saxophone because that happened when electronics was happening. So I didn't have to go to electronics. I did the violin for a bit because I could miss German. So music was a literal escape from the subjects I didn't like. But it's only when you look back, I think, and reflect on the contribution that it made. Uh, and I think it makes a significant contribution when you get involved in things like music, particularly because it's probably the only time in your week where you have that specialist instruction when it's just you and someone else. And I started with group tuition, as many of us do, but you quickly progress to having individual lessons. And there's you know, a part of your extended curriculum where that's one teacher, one on one. And it's probably the first time in your week where someone takes complete interest in your, where well, you hope, takes complete focused interest in your individual success, which is quite powerful, actually. And it's something I think we don't kind of get in your normal school life, do you? You don't get that individual um, attention. But also you get to learn what it's like to have a lot of criticism. And I think probably sport and music give you this. You get used to getting feedback from someone in quite an intense, detailed way. And you get used to get, having a second chance. I mean, I suppose in maths, you do your homework, you hand it in, you might get it wrong, you might do it again, but you carry on and do some more exercises. But in music and probably like sport, you do something wrong, you'll do it again, you'll do it again, and you'll do it again. And you'll probably do it again for the next three or four weeks. And I think it's a, a something that you don't get in any other aspect of your school life, where you have to keep doing the same thing over and over again to refine and improve it. And I think it's a really, really important, valuable contribution to your school week to be made to do that. And most of my career has been in the independent sector and I've really seen, and it's partly why I left the independent sector, I do love it, but in some respects I saw that tension between this isn't equitable, even within the settings I was working in, that there were some great experiences happening, you know, drama, music, art, 
we'd have over 150 events a year just in the arts alone and not in mention all the sport and all the trips and all the fantastic experiences which do make really sparky curious inspired young people and they go out into the world able to relate and connect with a variety of people because they've had such a rich experience but I was I was slightly torn because I could see that these experiences aren't consistent even across the group of schools I was working with. And I thought this, you know, doesn't seem quite right. So moving to the multi-academy trust sector where suddenly I'm in a very different community. I'm not in the city of London anymore. I'm not in uh, an area where lots of these experiences in the extended curriculum, such as going to the theatre, were on a doorstep. I could take a music class to go and see the Writer's Spring over lunchtime in my previous role. I could just stroll across a bridge and we were in our seats within a minute, leaving the classroom and we'd watch it and be back as if nothing had happened. But now I'm in a place where we couldn't do that. We'd have to think about coaches. We'd have to think about transport. But also we don't have any organisations like that on our doorstep. We can't just stroll down to the Museum of London. We can't walk around to the Barbican. We can't go sketching brutalist architecture. It's just not in our neighbourhood. So you start to think more deeply about what does this extended curriculum look like when you're not in that metropolitan area? But also you think, what does it look like when you don't have a resource to pay for it? What does it look like when this isn't part of these children's childhood? It's not normal to go to a concert. It's not normal to go to a museum. What does it look like? And so very much in my role as as a central team is getting to know the community. Who are the people and the young people we serve? Who are the families? But not also those most importantly, but who are our partners in the community that might play a role in our extended curriculum? I can't transplant the things and experiences I was doing in my last schools I have to find new ones. I have to find experiences that very much resonate with the young people. So a big piece of work I did was a youth consultation when I got my current role. So we interviewed or surveyed a thousand young people in Bexley, had some focus groups because I wanted to understand what does this mean to you? What does arts and culture and creativity mean to you in your life? Where do you go to engage in it? Who, what do you like doing specifically? Where, so using that helped to build our strategy and helped to prioritise the resource we have and where we put it. But with all the arts teachers I work with, I do focus on the arts, but with all the teachers really, in terms of extended curriculum, and this is similar to what Nikhail was saying really about, I suppose, normalising involvement and making sure people think deeply about what am I going to do? How might I get, get better at it? I ask my colleagues to consider who's missing out on this? Because we spend a lot of time, perhaps we track attendance to things, but we need to think deeply about who isn't here. Which particular young people are not going to those clubs? Which young people are not going to those choirs? Who are they? What do we know about them? How might we get them there? So I know maybe we'll talk about it later, but for me, impact is all about telling rich stories of individuals and the difference this work makes rather than trying to make big generalised claims. I'd rather invest in telling a great story about two people than having graphs and charts about participation. But that's my five minutes and 15 seconds. Very good. Everyone was on time. Um, So uh, first, just to say, um, please do put your comments, questions in the chat. I'm really keen to have as many of your questions and thoughts as possible in the second half of the of the panel. Um, We've got a couple in there already, which I will come to in a minute, but please do keep adding to it. I just wanted to come back to the point you finished on, Stephen, and sort of have that, I guess, is my kind of first question. We were talking about this a little bit before we we sort of went live. Um, One of the things I find uh, interesting about this whole area is how you make the case for it, because it's not something the government has ever massively invested in, uh, if we're honest. And certainly over the last decade or so, that investment's dropped considerably. Um, And if you look at the sort of, uh, additional money beyond the sort of general school budget that's now associated with music or sport it's, it's certainly much less than it was um it was uh, sort of a decade plus ago um and I, and I and i sort of feel a lot of organizations that try and make the case for more investment whether it's from government or from charity or philanthropy or wherever um find themselves arguing that it, it sort of helps with maths it helps with english it helps with you know getting a job is that the best way to make the case you know you talked about you know uh, smaller impact studies about how it has a personal impact on life. What, what's the best way we can make the case? I'll come back to you first and then I'll ask, ask the other two panellists for some thoughts on that too. It's a really difficult question and I think this is why organisations such as the Cultural Learning Alliance are so vital because we need those organisations to gather the evidence to help us collectively make a strong case because the evidence base probably is a little bit weak around the genuine impact some of this work has and so some of it is quite spurious. We might say that if you do Uh, piano lessons you might be better at multiplication and things like that and there are very small scale studies that show that but I think probably 
we need to work a little bit harder on what it, what are we trying to measure here and why might we even bother measuring it if we are going to make a case. And I think building on the work of a cultural learning alliance who gather this evidence and true, some of it is, you know, they're great claims that you're more likely to be an active citizen and lead a healthy life and have a job and keep it if you engage in the arts. It's powerful statements and I use it a lot in my job with trustees and governors, but I do think to myself, can I really back that up? Can I really show you that in 20 years time, this child who's got piano lessons here in our school will still have a job and will be healthy and happy? I couldn't do that. So, but I think if we probably can keep to work collectively on what are we trying to measure, work with organisations such as the Centre for Cultural Impact, which I know have looked at evaluation, so is the Royal Society of Arts, that what are we trying to measure here? Why might we bother? Um, and what can we look, I says we, we should probably be a bit more interested in learning from the experiences and the work we do rather than worry about trying to make a case for it. What are we doing well? What could we improve on? So any kind of evaluation and impact measure. But as I said earlier, I love individual stories because when you chat to young people and hear their stories of why this work matters, that changes everything. Um, and certainly when I've made films, even with a very small group of students in our schools, if I ask them, what do the arts mean to you? They tell such eloquent, beautiful stories about why they do it and why they have to make music. But I couldn't give you a chart and graphs about that information, but I could show you a film. So I wonder if maybe we need to be more inventive about what impact looks like and how we share that with others. But that's my take on it. Thanks. I mean, coming to you, Jeff, you, you're, you're, you're used to making, case, making the case for investment as a part of legacy projects for the events you've been involved in and so on. What, what do you think is the most effective way to, to, to build a case for, for more investment in, in, in the extended curriculum? I think simply just putting on Stephen's point, the fact that if we looked at Team GB success, even in Tokyo, we saw government move legislation in a week to raise the investment that we made for the next games in Paris. And I think there is some policy illiteracy here. I, I don't believe we should have to make the case. Independent schools already make that case. I have seen well-rounded citizens um, develop as that whole curriculum, whole school cultural approach. I think the inequality that I know I benefited from as a product of the 20th century, it's not given a indication of how long I've been on planet Earth, but I'd, I'd say watching sport and the arts almost etched out of, and I, I believe it came with the non-valuing of teachers. I know teachers predominantly gave of their good time in providing sporting and artistic um, activity, especially to the state school system. So I, I think we've got to strike a balance. I do think we need to provide some evidence, but I don't believe there's any more stronger evidence as i said with a social coach inspiring a young person to that story being told um i think you know that whole notion of the soft skills that we're looking for when we're deemed to be employable and entrepreneurial i i just think it needs to be a lot more holistic it needs to be a lot more integrated and i think there is a social culture and economic win-win-win for everybody but i do think there's too much of a hard sell taking place at this moment in time I think there was quantitative and quantitative data, empirical research. I think I've, I've seen so much research, but I think it's getting business and philanthropy to make the investment, not a donation. I don't think it's a charitable case. I think it's a well justified investment. And I think government always tend to follow where the corporate bottom line does also follow because they are going to be the employable or entrepreneurial citizens. The interactive age plays an important part but let, let's get some inspirational stories that can really be long lasting in the minds and hearts and inspiration and motivation of the diverse young people we want to inherit the world. Nicole? Um, I agree. And I think one of the things I've just been thinking about is, you know, just even the word enjoyment. Like when we think about childhood, some of our memories are about our experiences at school. And I think it's really interesting when we talk about the differences between the different offers available, depending on the type of school you go to. And I think it takes me back to it needs to be normalised. Like this just needs to be part of the school experience. We talk so much about personal development and, you know, all young people have to go to school up until the age of 18. They need to be in some form of employment, edu education or training. Um, and I think we need to be really realistic about if we truly are committed to levelling up the playing field, if we truly are committed to, you know, getting rid of inequalities, then we absolutely need to start by making sure these opportunities are valued 
un, are in place in schools. And I think sometimes you don't realize you're disadvantaged until you are in a different setting. And I, I'll be really honest, you know, my first experience of feeling, you know, different and a disadvantage in terms of what some of my um, peers who were really like middle class had had in terms of their school, school experience in comparison to mine was just how they even carried themselves in seminars and were able to quite confidently speak and, you know, present. And I remember being really nervous and anxious about that because it wasn't something that was really, you know, pushed or developed when I was at school. And I remember feeling and looking around and being like, why is it that they just can do this? Why is it so easy for them? And it's because it was just how they did things from school and it was normalised as part of their school experience. So for me, I think we need to be really honest and think about, you know, they are young people. They are the next generation. If we're really committed to building compassion in young people and the sense of community and working together and improving society, then we do need to be realistic about how much time is given in schools in order to allow that to take place. And I get that schools are under pressure to get those academic outcomes for young people because we get what it gives you is those qualifications. We know that's gonna open up doors. We know that's gonna help with social mobility, but we know as well, and sometimes often too late, that it's not just about your qualifications because you might have those qualifications to get you to an interview, but what happens when you can't articulate yourself? What happens when you're not able to talk about experiences um, and understand the importance of enjoyment and fulfillment? And I think what was quite interesting, particularly when we had the pandemic, is just like that, exams were cancelled. And there was a bit of panic because it's like, well, what do we do? Because everything has been about, we've got to get these qualifications, we've got to do these exams. I know many young people didn't understand what to do next. And it's because they were just so fixated on that one aspect that actually what was forgotten is this sense of community because what we noticed was so many communities coming together to support one another. We saw young people really getting involved and getting to know their communities. And when we reopened as a school and we were able to put back in place all of these sports activities and clubs, the young people really appreciated it because they realised what it was like when that wasn't possible for them. So I think we need to be really realistic about what the education system is about. And yes, absolutely, we need to make sure the young people get those qualifications. But what is equally as important is those experiences and those memories. Think about what young people, or as we going to adulthood ourselves what is it that we remember you know is it that we remember just doing those exams or is it that we remember those experiences of learning to play an instrument being part of a team and we also need to remember that just qualifications is not really the only way we can measure success you know there are other ways to measure success and I think it's important for young people who might not necessarily experience academic success still feel success in the talent that they may have or they may have worked hard at um, in doing all these different opportunities that are just as important. And I think generally as a society, we really do love things like football. You know, we love the arts, we go to the theatres. And I think for some young people, they don't necessarily see themselves as people that could be in the theatre that people are going to watch or that they could be playing that skill or be a professional boxer. These things need to be really a, a lot more inclusive. And I think schools need to not ignore that. We do have... A, a responsibility to provide these rich experiences where possible um, and you know think about what do staff offer because people who work in schools for example you'll be surprised at how many different things um, that they've been involved in or connections that they might have that they can also bring forward and, and put in place within their own school. Yeah. Sam, can I jump in? Sorry. Sure, absolutely. No. Okay. I just wanted to, no, Nicole, it's really interesting, but I thought it's so important for schools to know, this is when research is quite useful in terms of impact and access, because we can find out which particular cohorts of young people don't typically access certain things, and then that's why we can target them, can't we? And I know there's a brilliant book by Dave O'Brien and, and others called Culture is Bad for You, and so much of that is about particular people who don't get access to the creative industries and black women are hugely underrepresented in creative industries and one of my schools is 70 percent black young women so it shapes everything about i've got to give these experiences because 
they are typically not going to access them. They're not going to consider themselves as valuable members potentially of that profession. So I completely agree with you. And I think we just have to think quite deeply, don't we, about what do we know about who's missing out in this work and we nudge them towards um, certain things. I, mean, and I, just curious, I, I, I think enjoyment is such an important word. It, it, you know, if I think about, you know, my, my son does guitar lessons, my you know, daughter does art club, you know, they, they do tennis lessons. It's not because I'm thinking, oh, that's going to help them get a job in 10 years. It, it's because they, I want them to enjoy themselves and enjoy their childhood. And that's sort of just an absolute standard experience for sort of middle-class professional family like mine. Why it should just should be for everybody. But, but we don't, it feels like the sector isn't very comfortable making that argument. The, the I understand why, because, because, you know, you say enjoyment to the treasury and they look at you confusedly. That's not what their treasury worry about when they're thinking about where to invest money. But, but, you know, it's something that, you know, people, my, people like me and my family just do naturally. So why shouldn't everyone have that opportunity? Well, Simon, that's, that's the very point. Having met those civil servants, like traffic wardens, I wonder if they had a sporting and artistic experience that might have suggested they might have a more emotionally intelligent understanding and appreciation of what we all take for granted. I, I as, you, as you said, what you would provide your children, sporting and artistic experience, I exposed my children so they would become life resilient because I feared for how they would be viewed, how they would be treated. And I wanted them to develop the emotional armor to be able to handle the hard knocks of life. Um, you know, to learn to swim, to learn to defend yourself and learn to run were the prerequisites. There was no negotiation. So I got to 14, what do you really want to do? But I, I actually believe that every young person, child has a gift. They have a talent and it's for the teachers, the coaches to discover that gift and that talent and then nurture that well-rounded ability to have rights and responsibilities. And then, as I've said, the whole notion of teaching, I think certainly with the pandemic has now gone. I think teachers are now coaches. They've got to look at the individual. They've got to look at the collective grouping of those individuals, look at the setting that they're in. I'm autodidactic. I'm shaped by my environment. I'm, I'm, I'm a doer and I learn. You know, we've got enough research as to where boys are slower than their, their female counter, girl counterparts, and, but still developing well-respected, um, strong re, um, relationships that can develop you for life. Because when the employers say to me, Jeff, can you look at some organisational culture change? We need some common sense to match that academic sense. So it, it is, I think the curriculum does need to be looked at, and that's why the extended curriculum has so much potential. Thank you very much. Um, we, that was a that was a good a good a good uh, lengthy discussion we had there. I do want to sort of come to, to, to a couple of the questions we had. Um, uh, there's a sort of comment here from um, Lewis Searle. Um, sort of completely agree with Nikhil's observation earlier about the need to provide opportunities as part of a core school offer, um, so that everyone sort of participates uh, and engages. But many funders won't fund school based interventions. Schools struggle to find the time to provide them when they are stretched. Um, and that sort of relates to another question we had from Rachel Barnes, who sort of said, Nicole, you talked about co-curricular. How does this link to the in-class curriculum? So I guess sort of this, this leads to a sort of wider, a broader question as to how do we, how do we, how do you do that integration between the between the extended and the and the in-class? Um, and how do we persuade schools, head teachers who've got to cram everything in and funders to that it needs to be a sort of integral part, not sort of an add-on. And I'll come to you first, Nicole, because it was sort of directed part, mostly at you, but I'll let, I'll let the others come in too. Absolutely. So I think two things. So the, th the first is we avoid saying extracurricular because we don't see this as an add-on or an additional. It's just as important, which is why we've gone for the, the co-curricular offer. Um, so when I spoke earlier, I talked about some of the problems we faced before we had built it into our school day. So previously it was optional and the kids did see it as was extra and you know it was whether or not they could be bothered to attend and obviously that's not what we want them to think of that important time as so in terms of how we um have addressed that is we have um ensured we've timetabled it as a period and so every member of staff in the school they have that as part of their timetable and those students will be able to engage in that particular activity so for example if we are offering um, extra music lessons or whether that is a social action project or you know um, other really good organizations that offer these opportunities for schools 
um, that is something they would do each week on that day. So, for example, at the moment, this is the first year of us doing it, um, each year group have one period seven a week. So on a Tuesday, it will be a 10, which was today. On a Wednesday, it will be a nine. And so that is how we've made it as part of the school experience. And I can remember feeling like what would be the absolute goal um, for this being built into the school day? Because naturally, if students hear that they're now going to be in school till, you know, a, an extra period, how is that going to be received? And I thought to myself, an ideal would be for the students to look forward to their period seven day. And that's what we now have because the students are seeing now the benefits of being able to work with others, talk with students they wouldn't normally talk to and bond with their teacher in a different capacity. It might be that their English teacher by period seven is doing sport with them on the field. And it's really helped with building relationships. So I guess going back to the question, it's about really getting the school to buy into the importance of this work and seeing it as just important. Uh, we're not asking for every single period to be dedicated to, you know, all of these types of experiences. But one way of doing that is by providing some protected time where it can be um, something that is part of the school day and school experience. Thank you. Steve, you have anything to add on this one? Yeah, only briefly. I agree with Mikhail hugely. I think, yeah, you've got to make it part of a school day otherwise if it's optional. It's kind of you're not making it feel very important and people probably don't turn up to things. But yeah, I agree. We in BED, we have an electives programme. And so we've normalised the idea that you do an elective in both of our schools. So it means that we've got a range of you know teacher driven and student interest led activities. But I think having them compulsory is unquestionable that you engage in co-curricular activity. And I do agree with the language. Extracurricular isn't the right word, is it? I do prefer co-curricular. But I think also you have to think quite deeply about not having competition between the two. And this is why when trips can be quite tricky, because you end up pulling kids out of one thing to go and do another. And once you start setting up that opposition, it causes frustration. And that's when, you know, history teachers say, but they've missed all the lessons. They keep going out for music and vice versa. So building structures where there isn't that competition. So when we've done an art festival, we do not cancel any lessons and we do not conflict with any lessons. We work around it. We want anything artistic or anything co-curricular wise to feel business as usual. So this is not a special occasion. This is not something that competes with anything else. It's important enough that it has its own designated protected time. So yeah, I'm completely on board with what you said. I think I made the point earlier that accepting there's a crowded curriculum where there's so many targets, We've got to start using the curriculum in a more creative and innovative way. I mentioned the YouthWise programme. We learnt with boys they were not going to be switched on to the standard learning approaches when they had a mobile phone, providing their immediate teacher or their immediate knowledge and information. So we started looking at core curriculum learning outcomes, which is to read, write and count, but we're doing so through sporting and artistic learning. So, for example, the SoccerWise programme simply use soccer, stories, um, um, word counts, just simply engaging the, the student, but through what they were interested in. It's what we all are cognitively switched on by. What we're interested in is the best possible way of developing or modifying our, our, our behavioural characteristics. So we found that after a term, teachers were A, over the moon because they were getting far less challenge, but the curriculum learning outcomes were sufficient enough where as rightfully embedded as part of the everyday core curriculum learning um, experience. What people considered extracurricular, my extracurricular was going on those trips because I didn't behave, I didn't go. Um, but it was great when I wanted to go because I'd earned the right. And I think, again, having that reward, recognition and respect as the fundamental behavioural attainment and requirement in behaviour and performance that is individual, class, year and school brings that confidence and pride that I think is all important when we're looking to develop stronger and more cohesive communities. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think a related question to, to the discussion we've just been having about sort of the, the importance it's that is placed on this within the school, school curriculum um, and the school day from Joe Greenslade, who asks, do you think Ofsted recognises the value of extra or co-curricular uh, time and, and enjoyment sufficiently when currently assessing a school. I'll sort of come to Steve maybe first in this one with your sort of uh, maybe your hat as uh, as president elect at the Charter College as well. What's your <laughs> what's your what's your sort of sense on whether 
because there's some, there's some stuff in the framework about this. Is it is it is yeah. it enough? Is it is it the right kind of uh, approach? I suppose maybe. Kind of... Sorry to interrupt you. I suppose it's uh, personal development area. Probably is the space where it gives, and obviously character development. I think. No, I think it probably. I think there is space in the framework to to capture the benefit of this work, but I guess it is for the school to articulate what value it adds to a student's life. So I guess if there is no, obviously, Nikhil's school sounds incredibly coherent and very persuasive intent behind. So Ofsted's going to look at that favorably. But if I guess if you're offering a extra curricular program that seems somehow disconnected from your broader vision for your children, for your students, then that's not going to really contribute to an inspection uh, uh, kind of uh, evaluation of your school. But I guess if you've got a really coherent intent, it's somehow connected, you're, you're giving opportunities to catch a variety of, we you know, as Jeff's talked about, developing your character and your resilience. And it's, I think it's going to look really good. I don't see why Offset would not look upon this work favourably in the inspection framework. Nikhil? Um, I agree. And one of the things that I was really pleased to see in the new Ofsted framework was, you know, Ofsted as part of the outstanding descriptors have actually named the importance of schools promoting those extensive or rich experiences that are of high quality. And I think that is the emphasis there. When it is just something that's just extra or optional, it's very difficult to be able to see how that's been planned with intention and you know um, another thing that they also look at is take up you know how many students are participated and so I think where these this is done well if schools really do value this work and they have planned these opportunities um, you know as part of the school experience um, then it will be very very obvious when they go around to speak to young people and see for themselves that this is just part of how the school does things that you know the school places a lot of importance on these experiences because I think they've now recognised that we can't truly say that we are developing these young people personally if these opportunities don't exist. And I think one of the reasons why I'm, I'm a real um, fan of the way they've, they've updated this framework in light of this work is because I feel like now schools are beginning to really look at the value that is added to this work and then they are now addressing that within their schools. Um, but I, I, I also wanted to just, you know, um, go back to the point of those conflicting um, scenarios where you have got the academic curriculum and then all these trips that are happening and students missing out, like where do you get the balance? And I think, again, that, go, that goes back to planning. So if you are planning for these opportunities and there's a lot of creative ways in which schools can do this, then it shouldn't come as a surprise because people are aware whether that's in the whole school, the year calendar, you know, everyone is aware that these days will be coming up and the importance of these days, if it's actually written into the school calendar, um, again, places the importance on, on how that work helps shape the young people and develop their character in school. Yeah, that, that all that all makes sense. Yeah, and I, I, so I think I think there is there is some there is some there's enough there in Ofsted that it shouldn't discourage uh, schools from doing the kinds of things that we've been talking about today. That's uh, that's um, for sure. Um, so uh, one um, question that I wanted to uh, talk to you a bit about is we, we over the course of the arc talks that I've been involved in, money's come up a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, it's getting pretty tight for schools at the moment. Um, uh, with uh, with uh, the financial pressures coming from from every angle uh, at the moment, um, as budgets get tighter, um, both for schools, for local authorities, and for, for charities as well. What, what what tips do you have about how how you can still ensure that you're offering um, a good offer to young people? How how do we make the money work um, as effectively as we can? Um, Jeff, I don't know if you wanted to, to to give us some thoughts on this one be very controversial I think there's more than enough money I think we've seen a movement a sector in an industry develop and I think we need to remove a layer of superficial engagement with regards to sport art and cultural activity and see the money invested in a more cohesive and collaborative approach most funding requirements require evidence of multi-agency working I've yet to see that happen in the areas that most need it and I think we need to have a reset and really look at how schools become the focal point and they are best and well placed on developing well-established and well-dependable and sustainable um, 
partnerships and collaborations, we developed a concept called the Community Campus. With the school at the very heart of that campus, any community facility would give five hours of somewhere to go for the young people we wanted to engage with. The social coaches recruited, selected and deployed from the community, by the community, with the community, had the beyond the playground relationships of those who were waiting for those who will finish their school and those I might add who may not have been at school. But what I'm saying is we need to look at the investment going back into the schools, the collaborations that can be built around those schools. And then I think we'll start to see the resources that I believe are more than available. I see lots of money. It's just not being used efficiently and effectively enough. So I think let's look at it a lot more collaboratively, a lot more holistically and integrated, and then school whole community approach, and then see what that leveling up agenda might be able to do. Steve, do you agree? Do we have enough money? Yeah, uh, well, no comment. Mm -hmm. But I think, no, I do agree though with Jeff. I think probably arts, culture, music, and sports are fairly similar to that. There probably is a lot of money spent on things that aren't very good um, and aren't very impactful. And maybe there is some reconsideration of is this money going in the right direction and for the right people? I always think quite deeply about how much does anything cost per pupil? Um, because I think it's easy, you know, in past roles when I was perhaps doing more specialist music stuff, you could easily spend a thousand pounds on a masterclass for 10 students. But now, you know, in my current context, I couldn't do that. So I, I do think quite deeply about the cost per pupil for anything to do to make sure it really is um, value for money. But also, I guess, just building as many relationships as you can with people, your communities. There's often somewhere that has a shared priority and might have something to offer that might save you as a school some money be it a space they are welcome for you to come and use, or they might offer their services. I've, you know, have a housing association coming to decorate the music department in one of our schools because we couldn't afford to not make it look so dilapidated, but someone wanted to help us. So I guess it's just getting to know your community. There is always someone on your doorstep who probably shares your concerns for something that might be able to help. And maybe it's not money, but it might be the offer of services or other kind of support or space. So I think actually probably schools need that as much as money, I imagine, was my take on it. Annika? Um, I absolutely agree with what Stephen has said there as well, because I think there is something around getting to know your community, um, but also being really relentless about finding out what grants are available. There are lots of grants that are available that are more than willing to help fund projects in schools. And I get sometimes it's about finding that time and, and maybe making sure there's a member of staff in a school that is committed to this work so that they can get to know a, about the grants that exist, but also knowing their school community, you'll be very surprised how much connections or links parents and carers might have, you know, the staff within your school. So, it's, it's, it isn't always financial barriers. I get that does play a part, but there are other creative ways in which we can find out about, you know, what the community has to offer. And so many people would be more than happy um, to get involved and to work with schools because let's be honest, we've all had a school experience. We've all been there. And I think there will be more people who will, be able to think about their own experiences and the people they might know that will add value but yeah there's definitely something around surveying you know your school community reaching out to local businesses um and sometimes there's something in it for them as well you know it might be that they build that connection and then they think to themselves well actually if we get involved with this school this could be quite good for us as well so definitely reach out have a look at what grants exist and think about you know connections both at student parent staff level as well. I jump in quickly before yeah. I, just, I just was thinking about you know some funders for schools because you are right there's some actually quite you know very healthy funds available to support with work but I suppose you think about the process is not often a, a time friendly one and I wonder maybe we should think a bit more about the capacity of school you know leaders or teachers to actually complete some of the funding applications I know obviously in my role I have I've afforded that capacity, but I do think, you know, if there weren't certain people in central teams who have the time to put together quite lengthy proposals, to go through multiple rounds of funding to get big chunks of money to do things, how might schools access that? So I wonder if maybe there is something for certain funders to consider. How do we make this process school friendly so people can genuinely access our support 
uh, and make it as uh, as brisk as possible so we can because there are you know lots of ways other funders for other types of work make it very easy for people to apply for funding but i don't think it's always as easy for schools to access some resource if i may just build on that point i think it is a very good one because business in the community provide that expertise for the private sector i just don't think schools are aware of that provision that might be available to them local authorities have offices employed just to locate the grants and apply for those grants. So I think, again, it's how beyond the school gate those relationships are forged and built and developed. You know, we schools tend to believe that the school governorship is where you just need the, the, the expertise. But I actually think in building and becoming a facilitated broker of these related, um, I think, roles and responsibilities and areas of expertise can really help ease that pressure, but provide much added value when required. Because it is an art form in its own right. It's 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 a, it's a dialect. It's a hieroglyphic, and you have to know your way around. Yeah, as someone who's written many funding agreements in the past, I completely <laughs> agree. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop us there because we're we're about to to um, to run out of time, and I want to make sure we finish on time for everybody. Um, I. Uh, I want to say a huge thank you to our panelists. Uh, there's a couple of people who have put in the chat that it's been a really great session and it has been. Um, huge thanks to Jeff Thompson, Nick L. Briggs and Steve Berriman um, for sort of all of that. So there's a lot of useful tips, I think, as well for schools, as well as some sort of interesting broader points about how we think about uh, co-curricular or extended curricular uh, work um, and how we can sort of integrate it better and make the case for it um, more, more, more strongly. Um, in the future. Um, so as I said at the beginning, that's our last uh, ARC Talks for this for this year, and we've ended with a really good one. Um, we will be coming back uh, next year with a, with, a, with, a, with a, a new take and a new approach to the to these talks in the post pandemic pandemic era. So do look at, uh, out uh, for us um, when you're back after a, a, a summer break. Um, but for the for the time being, thank you very much, and uh, have a good evening, everybody. <laughs>